Okay, we're going to start um, chapter 13, and we're actually going to start in section 2, because in order to understand some of the interactions that happen in the other sections, we need to understand um, kind of the forces of attraction um, between the different molecules that are going on. And in order to understand that, we have to kind of reflect back to what we learned about polar and nonpolar things, um, polar and nonpolar compounds. So this sheet will kind of help you organize what we're going to talk about throughout um, the video. And it gives you some examples. Um, here you can draw those in. And then we'll talk about some of these examples here. And um, then at the very end, there's going to be two problems um, for you to do. So make sure that you do those. Um, I'll be checking on those problems. So this sheet you can use um, while you take your notes and then you can use those for the video quiz as well uh, if that's what you wish to do. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Let's recall some of the compounds we talked about. Um, we talked about um, ionic bonds and covalent bonds. So an ionic bond was whenever we had a metal and a nonmetal. And that meant that we were, one of those was the metal typically was giving up um, its electrons to the nonmetal. So one element was giving them away, another element was permanently taking those on. <clears throat> um, we also had nonmetals to nonmetals, and that meant we had what was called a covalent bond, and that meant we were sharing electrons back and forth instead of actually transferring them. So when we shared those electrons between the two nonmetals, um, we had two cases for that. We said the bonds could either be polar or they could be nonpolar. Um, and these just deal with how the electrons between the two elements got shared. So if you were polar, um, you were sharing your electrons unequally. And if you were nonpolar, you were sharing them equally between the two elements in the bond. Now, to understand the sharing of electrons, we talked a little bit about this word, electronegativity. So electronegativity basically meant um, the likelihood that an element will gain an electron um, or take some on or want those electrons. So when we have something that's really electronegative, that means it's really going to attract electrons to itself because it wants those electrons. If I have something that's not very electronegative, then I won't be attracting electrons to myself or it'll be very unlikely that I would do that if I were that type of element. So let's go ahead and look at bonds, a few different types. Um, when was a bond considered polar and when was it considered nonpolar? So here I have four examples. Um, one of the guidelines I kind of use uh, when I'm thinking about this is usually if, obviously if I have a non-metal and a non-metal together, then I will have um, a covalent bond. So I have to decide if I'm polar or nonpolar. Now, if I'm polar, usually I'll have a non-metal bonded to a different non-metal. Um, if I'm nonpolar, uh, usually it's the same element bonded to itself. Um, so that's kind of one of the guidelines I go by um, instead of, you know, calculating numbers. If I'm quickly looking at something, I can usually decide, well, this should be polar, this should be nonpolar. But when we did this, we used this little chart, and we had um, these numbers, and these numbers are our electronegativity values. So when we think about electronegativity values, we, um, the higher the number, typically the more electronegative you are. So if I have fluorine at a 4.0, that's very electronegative, and fluorine will want to kind of draw the electrons to itself, um, versus typically things on the left side of the periodic table, um, like the metals, don't really want to pick up electrons, and <clears throat> they will have lower numbers. So let's take a look at um, a bond between hydrogen and chlorine. So to figure out the if they're polar or nonpolar, we use some guidelines. We said if we have a value of 0.1 to about 1.6 um, between the two um, numbers, between the two electronegativity values, that bond would be considered polar. So here, if I look, I can kind of already say, well, hydrogen isn't bonded to itself, so this should be polar, meaning this element, um, if it's more electronegative, will probably pull the electrons to that side of the bond. But we can double check with numbers. So here I have chlorine is a 
3.0 and hydrogen is a 2.1 so that's a difference of 0.9 and if you needed to you could plug that in on your calculator um, that's fairly straightforward math so we take 3 minus 2.1 and we get 0.9 which falls between 0.1 and 1.6 so that should be polar <clears throat> now the next example I have hydrogen bonded to itself so right away I should say well if I'm bonding to kind of an equal partner then we both want the electrons equally because we're I'm bonded to myself I'm bonded to the same exact thing so um, that other thing will want the electrons equally as bad as I do so hydrogen to hydrogen should be nonpolar and I would subtract 2.1 the value for hydrogen from itself which would give me zero so anything with a value of zero will be nonpolar okay there's no unequal sharing in any direction um, carbon to chlorine here should again there's a nonmetal to a nonmetal so it's covalent um, it's not the same element bonded to itself so it should be polar um, and if I double check with my numbers I'll take chlorine is 3.0 minus carbon which is 2.5 and that will give me 0.5 which again falls between 0.1 and 1.6 um, now the last bond I have here is between a metal and a non-metal and for our purposes whenever we see this we will assume it's ionic the bond between these, these is ionic now for this particular section we'll be focusing a little more on the three types above here polar and nonpolar bonding we won't really worry about ionic stuff too much so when we decided if a bond was um, polar or nonpolar we used the numbers and then when we put this in a compound we drew little arrows um, and we called those arrows dipole moments so basically when there's unequal sharing going on in a bond we kind of draw in an arrow to show us where the electrons are getting pulled um, to which side of the bond so if I take hydrogen and bond it to fluorine um, and if I double check by subtracting the numbers I will get a polar bond and I can again kind of think about I have hydrogen not bonded to itself so this should be um, a polar bond fluorine is much more electronegative so when these come together I'll get a bond and then since fluorine is the more electronegative element um, fluorine will want the electrons and pull the electrons closer to its side of the bond so I draw an arrow indicating the movement of those electrons and they're being held out or they'll hang out a little more on this side of the bond um, on the fluorine side now so that this arrow would be the dipole so that's just showing the direction of where the electrons are hanging out now I if you remember electrons are negatively charged so if electrons are hanging out more on this side of the bond indicated by the arrow um, then I have a more a slightly more negative charge over here on this side and I indicate that with this little symbol which is called a delta and a minus sign so if the negative stuff's hanging out more over here and that means the charges aren't must not really be balanced between the two sides then this side then becomes a little bit more positive so we indicate that with a delta and a plus sign. So let's look at one more example. Um, if I have water, um, water is H2O, so if I bond that together, and if I look at my chart, um, then I will realize that oxygen is um, a little further to the right on the periodic table. Um, it has a bigger electronegativity value than hydrogen. So... <clears throat> Um, the dipoles will both go from the hydrogens up to the oxygen and so the electrons are going to hang out with the oxygen a little more than the hydrogen and that means I have a slightly more negative charge up here and a slightly more positive charge down on this end now overall if I want to think about um, kind of the polarity here since both um, of the arrows point away from the hydrogen I can kind of think of this overall as one big arrow um, pointing up towards the oxygen meaning this end of the molecule will be negative and this end of it where the hydrogens are will be more positive so you can kind of indicate that with one arrow instead of the two
So let's decide if a compound is polar or nonpolar. And we're going to do this by drawing the Lewis structure. So basically a picture of your molecule. Here I have carbon with four chlorines. So carbon goes in the middle. It is in group four of the periodic table. So it gets four dots around it, or four electrons. And each of the chlorines will bond at one of those spots, because each chlorine wants to pick up one um, since it's in group 7, and we'll bond it this way. Now, to figure out if the whole compound is polar or nonpolar, basically what we're going to do is we'll, we'll draw the picture and then draw in our dipole moments, or our arrows. So, we'll always draw the arrows facing a, or pointing towards the more electronegative element. So, I can see here I have carbon and chlorine. Chlorine has a slightly bigger number than carbon, and it's located further to the right on the periodic table. Usually the more electronegative elements are always further to the right. So I should draw an arrow facing away from carbon. The electrons are hanging out more up here. Chlorine wants them a little more. So that'll be a slightly more negative charge. Same thing on all of these bonds. So each of the individual bonds should be polar because I'm pulling some of those electrons away from the carbon and they're hanging out with the chlorines a bit more. And when I do that, um, in this case, I have four arrows kind of pulling in equal directions. There aren't any leftover um, electrons here on carbon. Everything's been shared. and this equal pulling in each direction kind of cancels out the fact that I have some unequal bonds. Um, I have some polar bonds. So overall, since I have equal pulling in each direction, um, then I have a <coughs> nonpolar compound. Now, here I have carbon with a hydrogen and three chlorines. So again, I'll draw in my arrows. So just like the last compound, I should draw an arrow towards each of the chlorines. But I have a hydrogen over here, and my hydrogen is less electronegative than carbon. It's got a lower number, and it's further, um, carbon's further to the right on the periodic table than hydrogen. So the electrons in this bond will actually be pulled closer to the carbon. Okay, so the arrow faces this way, meaning the hydrogen over here is a little more positive. So if you can see, the balance of the charges here is not quite as, is not equal like it was over here, and my arrows, it's not equal pulling. I have um, an extra pull going to the left, kind of just like this, meaning overall, this should be polar because I don't have an equal pulling on each arrow. Now, let's go ahead and look at this last example. This is SO2, or sulfur dioxide. When I draw the Lewis structure for SO2, um, sulfur is group 6, so it will, get, it will start with 6 dots around it. And each oxygen also has 6 dots. Um, but uh, sulfur is one of the molecules, when I draw the Lewis picture, if I notice here, I have two electrons, um, each line stands for two electrons, okay, and so that means I have two, four, six, eight, ten electrons around sulfur. Sulfur is one of those exceptions where I can illustrate it like this, so don't um, get confused with thinking you only have to have um, eight electrons represented around an element. Sulfur is an exception. So each oxygen starts with six dots. We want like eight electrons. So we, um, each oxygen will take two electrons from the sulfur, and I illustrate that with um, the lines. And oxygen happens to be a little bit more electronegative than sulfur. It's a little bit higher in, on the periodic table. So if you're kind of in the same column and one element is higher than the other, that element will be a little more electronegative um, based on the size. So on this one, I'll draw each arrow down to the oxygens. But, so you might be tempted to say, well, this is equal pulling to the right and the left. But I have these lone pair electrons at the top, which will have their own kind of renegade pulling going on since they're not bonded to anything. So overall, whenever you see a lone pair of electrons on an element, um, they will have their own pull and typically make the compound polar. So for that reason, this is why this compound is polar.
So go ahead and finish up your notes, um, and we'll continue this tomorrow, uh, and there'll be a quiz on this, so make sure you have good notes.